Well, our final little mini video here on using variables with the for each loop container is how to loop through every row in a result set. So how to loop through every record in a row set, in a data set, whatever term you want to use. So I think the first thing we'll do, let's come up with a result set. I am going to use SQL Server and I'm going to use the AdventureWorks 2008 database and in the, let's use the department table. I want something with not too many rows right now. Um, okay, fair enough. So 16 rows and they're fairly basic number, string, string, date, uh, date time to be specific. And if we take a look, come over here, look in the table, then you can see the, the data types are fairly innocuous, really not much uh, to them. The only reason I wanted to come over here was to see what type of an integer this was. It's a small int. Okay, so what I want to do inside of SSIS is for each row in this table, I want to do X. I want to send an email. I want to uh, create a text file. I want to execute a stored procedure with the parameters of the stored procedure provided by this row's values. Uh, I need to call a .NET um, method and pass in the values of this row uh, department ID and name sales as parameters to that method. Okay, pick up whatever you need to do. Think of whatever it is in your mind. The bottom line is, for each row in this result set, you need to look at what the data is and pass this data to something else. You don't need to pass an entire set. You need to pass a scalar value. And if you remember from the last video, the scalar value means one value per row. So this column has a single value per row. There's no nested columns. You're not passing result sets. So I'm not getting too deep yet because I'm not getting into the execute SQL uh, task that's going to be in just a few minutes here, just a couple of videos now. Uh, so let me create a package. And I want to show you how to do this, okay? And, and maybe it'll flesh itself out as we kind of get through it here. Uh, so there's going to be a couple of steps here. Uh, let me write some annotations. So step one. Um, load up a result set into a variable. So just to make sure you can read that, that's what we're and that's an SSIS variable. And then, oops, didn't mean to uh, do that, sorry. And you hit control and enter to actually do the new line. And then step two, for each row in the variable, perform your task or whatever that you need to do. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We need a variable, right? So go to my variables. And to store result sets, you need to use the object. So I want to make... I'm going to make my variable package scoped because I want to be able to pass this to containers, out of containers, to different tasks that are not in the same container. I want to marshal a result set across different boundaries. And as such, I'll call this one my result set. As such, I need it to have package scope. So I make it of a, a, a type system.object. System.object, you can store result sets, you can store pointers, you can store uh, literal objects, you can store uh, you know, value types in an object. Uh, so I'm just going to use that to store my result set. Now to load this up, I've got a couple of different ways I can do this. Um, I'm not going to show you probably the most logical way that I would do this particular example. The most logical way is the execute SQL task. I'm not showing it yet because I've got a whole section coming up on specifically doing this and a lot more with the execute SQL. So I'm going to bring in the data flow task and call it step one. 
And I want to show you how to use the data flow task. Let's make an OLEDB source to the SQL Server. So I'll connect up to my local host to the AdventureWorks 2008 database. And you want me to write a query or you want me to just drop it down and select it? You, you said a query? Okay. Figure I got a 50% chance. So. Uh, so I call from human dot uh, human resources dot what was it department okay very good you can see the columns that are chosen and we say okay now how do I load it into a variable now we talked earlier in chapter four about using the row count and how the row count can actually populate variables but it stores the row count. And that's not what we want. We want the entire result set loaded into an SSIS variable. Well, that's where your destinations come into play. Right? Now we want to use the record set destination down here. So this allows us to populate an SSIS variable with a result set. So that's what I'm going to use. I just drag it over here, put my input columns in, double click on it. Down at the very bottom, I get to choose which variable that it's going to store. And just like all the other ones that have this, don't you wish that these, these are all read only? Don't you wish they didn't show up? But they do. So go down and I choose user result set, the one that we just created. Sweet. Now, if I say OK, I'm going to get an error message because I need to click Input Columns. You notice that it does not default to choosing all of them or any. So I, if I want every one of them, that's what I would choose right here. Okay, now, if you needed to, you could go define, you know, change things right here. I don't want to. I just say OK. And I'm done with the data flow task. So that is accomplished step one. I've loaded the result set into a variable. Okay. Well, now let's do step two for each row in the variable. So we'll come out of here and we say step two. For each row in the variable, do whatever your task is. And I, again, I'm keeping it simple. I'm focusing on the hard part of the logic, how to actually perform the for each row in a result set operation. You kind of have to put in your own what that is you need to do. So my collection this time is the for each ADO enumerator. I'm looping through an ADO result set. Uh, so I choose that. It says which variable, the result set. And you can take a look at the fact that you're dealing with a data set, an ADO.NET data set here uh, with that record set is what I loaded. And that can actually have multiple tables in it. So which table are you loading? Or which table do you need to work with? Um, I'm going to do rows in the first table, which is what you would use when you only have a single table. So in my variables mapping, this is just like it was in the last video when we mapped to every column in a hand-typed item list. You remember when we went in the last video, we created the for each item, and then we added all those columns, and we mapped everything, right? And we created one column per or one variable to match each column. This is the same kind of logic here. So I'm going to choose my ADO. And I need to know two things. I need to know the order, the ordinal position of the columns. And two, I need to know the data types. The first column that comes back, column zero, is department ID. The second column, column one, is name, string. So small int, string, string, date time. Okay, come back over here. Let's make ourselves some variables. Let's make a, uh, I can go ahead and scope this to the step two, and I can name this department ID. And I spent some time looking at the data types for this one, and I've got, I know it was an integer, 
And now I kind of need to understand the mapping between the .NET data types and the SQL Server data types here for this to be effective. So let's try to maybe put some things here. This maps to the small end. Uh, let's see if I can get this like to all line up right here. Sorry, that look makes you nervous. This maps to the SQL int, and this maps to the big int. Now, those are your SQL Server .NET data type mappings. So, the data type we needed, or the SQL Server data type, was small int. So, we have to choose int 16. I'm going to intentionally choose the wrong data type. Remember, you have to initialize numbers just so that you can see what effect that has. Now if I make this read only it's going to perform a slight bit faster. Uh, that way it doesn't have to put any concurrency locks on it. Uh, let's now make a what was it a department name? Name. And that's a string and I can change the name that's okay I'll make it department name. And then we had group name was the next And I'll put a space in that for, uh, no, I won't. It's just crazy. And what was the last one? Modified date. And maps to the date time. And you do have to seed it with something. So YYYYMMDD will, should be sufficient. It doesn't like that. Uh, dash here. We'll get it and kind of play around until you get it to work. You're not going to use those values, uh, the default values right there. You just have to set those up for the variable just required.